Can we all stand together and let me lead you in a word of prayer and let us sing some song? Father, it is a privilege uh, that we cannot take for granted as we come together with brothers and sisters in Christ to honor and worship and glorify you corporately. Father, thank you for this uh, special place that you've given us and provided for us. And for this specific time, I pray that our, our words, our, our listening, our songs, our giving, um, our fellowship time, all of this would, would be honoring and glorifying to you as we come together with joyful hearts and uh, singing in our hearts as well as our, our lips, Lord, that um, you would be honored. And we just thank you for this beautiful day that you provided. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Remain standing and let's sing and describe it.
we want to start off this prayer this morning with, with what took place yesterday. Thank you, Lord, for, for just smiling at the beautiful weather that we enjoyed, the beautiful faces, the beautiful smiles that we enjoyed, the people we got to rub shoulders with yesterday. And, and, and we just thank you for each one. And I pray, Father, that there was, I pray, I pray that that as you multiply the, those blessings and those gifts that were sent out yesterday, I pray, Father, that they reach a multitude, and I'm sure they did, a multitude of people and bless a lot of uh, families and, 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 and just, uh, and we just thank you. Thank you for letting us, letting us, this, this church family, uh, take part in that and be part of it. And now, Father, we come to this part of the service where we pass the plate and uh, take up an offering. And we pray, Lord, that uh, we give, we're going to give a portion back according to how you have, not what you're going to do, but what you've already done in our hearts and in our lives. But, Lord, most of all, we want to thank you for, for saving us. We want to thank you, Father, for sending your son Jesus into this world to set us an example, to teach us, Lord, how to love you with all of our heart, mind, body, and soul, and then to love each other. And, and, and I just noticed and seen that that's what took place yes, yesterday, loving each other. And we thank you. And God, uh, we thank you for not only set, he came to this world to set us an example, but he also came to give his life for us, and to shed his blood on that cross, and died for us, for us, for a sinner like Calvary. Lord, and we just thank you, thank you for that, and Lord, now as we take up this offering, pray, Father, that you will bless it, that you will multiply it, and that you will spread it all around the world, and so that to, to, to build and to glorify your name and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Jesus, aren't you thankful he is faithful? He is our faithfulness. Always, no matter what we're going through. There's someone playing the piano behind that <laughs> <laughs> arrangement. Sue's hiding back there. Tell her to stand up. We don't have a stand player piano. Up. She's actually playing. You wave out, we see. She likes hiding back there. I need the young people to help me up here. Y'all come on up here. Any more young people. <laughs> We're gonna I tell you what. Normally, um, we we try to be very reverent and and respectful during our worship time. And I, and I was debating on having a little conversation because we're getting around here by the, the moment. I mean by the month. We just get louder and louder. But this morning. I'm going to give you a little pass. I'm going to ask you all to be rowdy in just a moment, okay? In just a moment. It's a rarity, so enjoy. What we're going to do, y'all are going to help me, okay? I am going to try to direct you to that door right there. They, some of them are going to try to direct you to this door. Some of you, some of them may help me direct you over there. What your job is, is to listen carefully. And see if you can hear my voice direct you to the right door. They're going to be as rowdy and loud as they want to be to direct you wherever they want you to go. So you just have to listen. The catch is that you have to have your eyes closed and don't cheat. Okay? And you have to listen carefully. But they need to know. They may not know your names or remember your names. So I want you to tell them. Tell them, tell them what your name is. Jalen, JJ, and Gemma. Jalen, JJ, and Gemma. Your job is to call out their name and say, go this way, go that way, go back, turn around, go to the right, go to the left. You direct them to whichever door. I'm going to move this. It's up to you. Mom's going to be my, <laughs> my job is to direct them to a specific door. Okay? All right, come on here. Please. Come on here. All right, you can stand right here. And I'm going to twirl you around. And you have to close your eyes and you have to trust. Okay, we're not going to direct you into running into something, are we? <laughs> okay. So close your eyes. And if you have, if you just have to open your eyes, look down at your shoes. Okay, don't don't look up because that's cheating. We don't want to cheat. You ready? Okay, close your eyes. Okay, I'm going to twirl you around. Okay, twirl around. You twirl yourself around. Okay, stop. Whoa, 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 stop. Keep your eyes shut. Keep your eyes shut. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right, JJ, you too. Come in. Come in. Come on, JJ. JJ. Twirl around. Keep your eyes closed. Keep your eyes closed. You, you got you to participate too. Come on, JJ. Okay? All right, y'all ready? You ready? Okay. You know what your job is to confuse them. Close your eyes, JJ. Be loud and rowdy. Close your eyes. Y'all ready? Close your eyes, JJ. Listen. See if you can determine which voice to follow. All right, go. JJ! Jamal! 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 Close your eyes. Go! Go! Jamal! Close your eyes. Go straight. Go straight, Jalen. Go straight, Jalen. Go straight, Jalen. Jamal, turn around. Go straight. Turn around. Jalen, go straight. Turn to the right, Jamal. There you go. Turn to the right a little bit more. <laughs> turn to the right. <laughs> turn to hey, Jay, look out, Gemma. Hey, Jalen. Jalen, turn to walk. the left. You walk straight? Jalen, left. <laughs> okay, stop, stop, stop. stop, stop. Can y'all give them a hand for both of us? Can y'all sit right down and sit back here for a moment? I have a couple. You can sit back here just a second. I have a, to ask you something. Why didn't you go anywhere? Why didn't you go anywhere? <laughs> the rules. Why were you afraid to go somewhere? Because I don't know where to go. <laughs> I don't know where to go. I didn't know which way to go. I didn't know how you would respond, <coughs> to be honest with you. But it was kind of chaotic, wasn't it? There's too much going on. You had people telling you you're all the <coughs> directions. Today, we're talking about John the Baptist. And the angel of the Lord came and told his daddy and his mom that when John the Baptist was still in his mother's <coughs> womb, the Holy Spirit was going to come on him. And his job was to tell people the right direction to go 
And they had all these other voices telling them where to go. And they had to listen. And the angel of the Lord says that John the Baptist will turn a lot of the sons of God, the daughters of God, back to the right direction. So John the Baptist had a very important job. It's confusing when people tell you to go all kinds of different directions. That's why it's so important for us to listen to the voice of God. We have to listen. How do we hear God speak? Through what book? What book? You know what book we hear God speak? The Bible. Good job, Jim. The Bible. That's how we hear His voice. Because there's so many other voices telling us to go all kinds of ways. Social media and friends at school and all kinds of stuff. We have to listen because there's a right way and there are a ton of wrong ways. So we really have to listen carefully. Y'all be great. Thank you for helping us to understand. Count on it. <laughs> Y'all are good at being valid. We're going to sing the song. It's probably new to most folks. It's just a chorus. It's simple, but it's talking about the holiness of God and the graciousness of God and the preciousness of God. But it, then it talks about our response to those things. So let's stand if you if you can. Just stand and let's sing this together. Holy, holy.
got a few other people that want to speak, but I got something I want to read to you that I ran across uh, about a month ago. And I sent it to Steve because it it really hit me in a way. The name of it is The Price of Being a Pastor. Being a pastor is listed among the four most difficult professions in the United States. Why? Because a pastor must be a preacher, an example, a father, a husband, a counselor, a conference hall, a planner, a minister, a visionary, a director, a mentor, a friend, a reconciliator, a marriage counselor, a youth counselor, a leader's trainer, a Bible teacher, and an intercessor. Besides being keeper of the temple and the cleaning staff, the pastor doesn't visit or this is something to say. Every pastor constantly confronts many different things, such as he don't visit. Sermon was too long. <laughs> the music was too loud. The bill was too cold. And one of the most difficult things in the life of a pastor is to know that at some point, some of the people in their lives will abandon or even betray them. The pastor is often the loneliest person in the congregation. You may see a pastor be surrounded by people. But very rarely, those people who are interested are not interested in his problems, his needs, or even his life. If you have a pastor as a friend, which thank God we do, take care of him, pray for him, connect with the vision that God gave him, support him, and above all, remember they're human, the same way we are. They go through the same troubles. Even if you don't believe it, many of them have sacrificed comforts, rest, personal plans, and so many things, including some of their own family's needs, to attend God's call. Value the time a pastor puts into his work, the prayers that he makes for everyone, the burden he voluntarily carries for the ministry. You don't know how much he appreciates knowing that you do. Jeremiah 3 15 says that I will give you shepherds according to to my own heart, who shall lead them with knowledge and understanding. Steve, we just want to say thank you. We love you and we appreciate you and all that you do. Yeah. Brother George, <laughs> want to come say a few words?
you my time. He always dreaded when I get up here. He don't know what I'm going to say. He's all flipped, so I'm here to aggravate him. He'll back him a little bit. Um, just, I want to mention just a few things. My, mine ain't pretty similar to George. I think a lot of him. Um, I was on the pulpit committee that recommended him to the church. And I had a little bit of hesitation, not for the fact that I didn't think he needed to be in the ministry. I thought it would be harder for him to start pastoring a church he attended for about a good while. But uh, we had a couple of ladies on it, and they, uh, they really convinced me that he was the man for the job, and his time was ready, and I for one percent agree with that. I appreciate what he's done and the job that he has done in um, leading the church. I, I look at my relationship with my wife and I transfer it to Steve sometimes. Uh, I, I got a good wife, but I don't want her to quite figure me out. So I do the same thing. I do the same thing with Steve. I don't let him quite figure me out. I don't even guess some, some, of, the, some of the things. Um, I will shortly wrap it up. I, um, I got to know him from a lot of different perspectives, from some outings. Um, he's a he's, he's pretty, pretty impressive young man. I look at his life and I see uh, he tells you a lot about his, his stepdaddy, discipline, and his mother, and uh, his sisters. Probably had to put up the right good bit, but they, my students attached to him pretty good, so it all, all came out in the wash. But what really impresses me about Steve is, um, I, you know, you always need a pastor to baptize a few, bury a few, and speak to a few, few funerals and stuff. And I've heard, I know all of y'all have too, I've heard a lot of speakers that can put sentences and phrases together and really draw your attention. And Steve can do that, uh, but he, he, what I really love about him is he walks and talks. He don't just talk. He, you see it in his life. Uh, you know, he, he's got a lot of musical ability. He, he, he can sing, play the piano. But the things that impress me the most is when he comes up here and sings with Michelle, he has a heart for people. He put a lot of time in in visiting David and most that he thinks he did the same thing. Um, he don't he don't pray them. They the least or the biggest they all the same seed. That really touches my heart. Uh, he, he's, a, he's a great example of what we all should try to be in uh, and how we deal and interact with people. Um, there's a lot of uh, Growing up, I talked about his mother and daddy, which things he shared with you. There's, there's two people in his life that I'm aware of, and the times that I have been around him and been with him, that's influenced his life to a pretty big degree. Uh, I think Earl Spivey had a pretty big influence on him. And I think Danny Hawken prepared him for the ministry. I've seen, I seen their interactions. I've been camping with them. I think Dennis up here a time or two. Um, he invested a lot in Pastor Steve um, and his and his people. Um, I just uh, I thank you for putting that with me and what you're doing for the church, the heart you got for, for people, and and I'm I'm about the oldest coon around here that's been going a long time. I'm be ten five years old. Already coming in, I'll see if you go. But I have a tremendous concern. It's a great church, senior citizens, and the things that we do. I didn't think you just could be replaced, but you have. And that's that ministry still going on. But I want us as a church to push for young people and doing things to get them more involved because we ain't going to be here forever. Um, but basically, uh, I thank Steve for. All the ifs that he puts on. He wants everybody here to find their niche in life and, and find a way to apply it to God's service. Uh, Calvin's got horses. We've got people who's got food, man. Um, there's just 
so many areas that we all have interest in and we put our heart and soul in it that we can make it work for the Lord's glory. Thanks, Steve. It's a uh, have to re enlist, so to speak, every Sunday and every Wednesday. To say, okay, God, I'll, I'll speak again. I'll, I'll do what you call me to do one more time because it's just it's just an overwhelming responsibility. So it is my privilege to stand before you and to be here. And I do appreciate the kindness, and so does Sonia, and all the cards and the love. Um, it's it's wonderful. Just like yesterday. Uh, there's so many folks that pick up the mantle and do what God has called you to do and you serve and you love and you give and you minister. And I am spoiled to be here with you and I realize that. And I've been a part of a lot of great churches and I'm thankful for that, but I couldn't ask for a better congregation and people that love. We don't always agree. And we're not going to if we're honest with one another. But I've never been a part of a congregation that loved any more than not just each other, but others, um, visitors and members, and um, uh, it's it's a privilege and a part of my journey as a believer that uh, I am very thankful for. Not to mention that both of our girls grew up here, and you all loved on them and taught them, and uh, it means a lot. We have a lot of fond memories here, so thank you for that. I guess you expect me to change my sermon now. <laughs> you mean I that wasn't it? <laughs> that wasn't it. Um, I've forgotten the announcements, and I was getting ready to do that when uh, someone interrupted. So <laughs> thank you all for all the kindness, and I can't say that enough. We are overwhelmed with your kindness. Um, I saw there was an insert in the bulletin that uh, talks about uh, our housewarming uh, I don't know if you know about house warmings. I've only been to one or two. It's like an open house where you just come and visit. And um, I wrote on here with big letters and exclamation marks, no gifts because y'all have been so giving to us, not to mention today, just giving to us, especially in the building of the house, <coughs> praying and asking how things are going. We would love for you to come and visit with us and see the house and and just fellowship together, but do not bring any gifts. That was, we, Tony and I talked about that. Um, so I don't know if you've been to other housewarmings and what 
Do not show up with a gift and you will not come in the door. <laughs> Turn away. So, um, and we're uh, so grateful for your kindness. And we'd love to see you. And um, appreciate all the, the help in the past you've given to us. Acknowledge your, your calendar there for November. Can you believe November's upon us? Uh, it just rolls on. The calendar just keeps on moving quicker and quicker. Um, more rapidly. And if you look in your bulletin, you can see Operation Christmas Child. Yes, it's that time of year. Please note the, the details in your bulletin about Operation Christmas Child. What to do, what not to do, what to pack, what not to pack. The um, What's going to happen if you can help with that. It's there in the bulletin when that's taking place. Please note that if you've never been a part of that, we will have this whole platform full of Christmas shoe boxes that will be sent out all over the world to spread the gospel. Uh, so to many children that not only have never received the present, but have never heard the name Jesus. So we have an opportunity to help in that and participate. So please keep that in mind. Put that on your calendar. Also, team leaders, we have a meeting this Tuesday at 6. This time is different. It's an hour earlier. Please be here at 6 o'clock. We have budget items to discuss and new officers or new leaders for each team. And that's this Tuesday at 6 p.m. Please keep that in mind, as well as all the other things listed. And um, refreshments coming up next Sunday. And, uh, and, of course, our prayer concerns and praises on the back of our bulletin. A lot of folks going through procedures, surgeries, uh, dealing with... Um, all kinds of issues, physically and other issues as well. Um, Ms. Jackie, um, Barry said that he, he has a pick line now, is that correct? Yes. Is he still there at the hospital? Okay. Continue to lift up Barry and, and, um, and all the others that we mentioned. Um, Brother John, uh, Ann's brother, has made it home safely back to South Africa. Um, we so enjoyed him being here. Uh, Nick had a a co-conspirator. <laughs> uh, now he's on his own again. <laughs> but um, it was so uh, so good for him to be here. But just so you know, you pour into other people's lives, and I think you've left an effect and indelible mark in John's life as well. So thank you for loving him. You know, and others that they come to be a part of Mormon Baptist Church, your love just uh, exemplifies that of our Lord as you get that message out very clearly. How's your mom? Thank you, George. Uh, mom is at Grand Strand Hospital. Uh, she's a little confused and sometimes a little agitated. She pulled her IVs out yesterday morning. Um, so they sedated her a little bit. Um, her blood pressure's coming down. It was a two something over a one something when she went to the emergency room um, Friday night. So um, I think that's probably where my sister is right now, Holly. So we'll find out after the service. But continue to pray for Fangie Cashin. I uh, would appreciate that very much. All right. Uh, uh, just so you know, if you weren't here yesterday, even if you were, uh, there are a lot of things left over. Uh, we were trying to see if there's a connection with uh, hurricane victims uh, upstate or in one of the mountain regions that could use what we have. Y'all are welcome to go look yourselves uh, and pick from that since the giveaway is over. But we're, uh, and we, I heard this morning there's a church that uh, a lady is a part of that was here yesterday. They may come by after our service today and, and look. It's free, it's a giveaway. Uh, whatever's left is free to whomever needs it. That's the point. We, we met a lot of folks. Some of those are here today. We're so glad and thankful that y'all are here with us. Um, and it teaches us about grace. Grace is unmerited. I had a couple people to ask me, and one lady said, I have never heard of a yard sale where things were free. So, well, she said, why would y'all do that? It's because God's grace is free. And we're giving because we've been given, too. I, I want to share this one with you, and then we'll get to our hour-long sermon. <laughs> uh, I'll share this with you. There was a man that came early. Pretty gruff in his demeanor. I didn't really want to speak. I spoke to him, but I um, didn't get much of a response. And he was kind of just perusing in a, an aggressive kind of way. You'll understand that. Me and Hunt, we don't shop. But 
he uh, went over there to him. He actually, I was talking to someone else, and he was over on the other side of the tent, and he held up a guitar that someone had just brought um, just a little bit before that. And he said, how much is this? Again, with a pretty gruff. He said, it's free, just like everything else. And I walked over there to him, and I thought he was going to cry. He said, I have something for my child. I found something for my wife. And I just started trying to learn the guitar, and now I found something for me. And his whole demeanor had changed. He said, I can't believe this is free, and that it was here to begin with. And I said, well, that's what God does. He provides. He's just passing that on. So I want you to know, because, um, you know, there are a lot of stories out there, and I'm looking forward to hearing some of your stories as you were speaking with folks. But I want you to know that, that just compassion, benevolence, love, as we find in God's Word in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, love covers a multitude of sins. Love softens hearts. Uh, love shows people who God really is. And I was talking to one person and said, sometimes it's just time for us to put feet to our faith. That's why we do things like this. And it's so important. So today we're talking about John the Baptist, and I hope you got the illustration there with our children, because there are so many voices in this world, as there was back in John the Baptist's day, telling people which way to go. Do y'all get that? Do you understand that? Do y'all watch TV, listen to the radio, you're on social media? Everybody has some advice in which direction we need to go. What you need to do, who you need to vote for, what you need to buy, what you can do without what you need to eat, what you can't eat, where you need to vacation, where you can't vacation. Everybody has an opinion about your life and my life, and those voices are overwhelming. And I, I really didn't know how the children would respond, but it's not uh, unthinkable that they would just hover because they didn't know where to go. We can do the same thing if we're not listening to God's voice. There's so many people pulling and pushing and telling us which way to go. It's just too much. So we just hover. Uh, Sonia and I went goat wrangling yes, yesterday morning. Was it yesterday? Saturday. Yeah, yesterday. It was a long yesterday. Uh, Friday. Friday. Um, I passed some goats on the way to church building um, to help prepare. They were huddled in the street. There were six of them, just huddled, scared to death. And then they went over to the side, and I got here, and um, I text a, a, a text to a neighbor. Long story short, our neighbor had gone to Disney World, his goats. We didn't know he had goats. They got out. How did he get out? Two pigs at his house. Let them out. True story. So if the pigs don't stay in the fence. They just want to get into the goats. So they break down the fence. The goats escape. The hogs lay back down and go back to sleep. So it's like a storybook, but it's the truth. So long story short, Sonny was leaving that afternoon. Saw him out on the field. We had six or eight people wrangling goats trying to get them into the wagon. And somebody's yard that we didn't even know. We met our neighbors by chasing goats around. But the thing was the goats were so afraid. And they had one leader. Um, he, he must have been the, 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 the patriarch of the group. Wherever he went, they would follow. It didn't matter if it was toward a street, a creek, the woods. It didn't matter. They followed him, whatever. And they were so close together, huddled. Even when they went into the wagon, to the trailer, they followed him. They didn't know where they were going. They just followed him. And he was huddled close together. We have to hear the voice that leads us. Because everybody's trying to wrangle us and push us, and sometimes in the wrong direction. John the Baptist's whole job was to be the voice of the one coming. The voice in the wilderness, which depicts our world, folks. A place of desolation, a place of death, a place of hunger, a place where you can't be filled, you can't have that, that peace that only comes from God. So John the Baptist's whole job was to be the voice of one saying, there's one coming, there's one coming, prepare for his coming. And the, the angel, even before John the Baptist was born, as I share with the children, told his parents, the Holy Spirit will come on him while he's yet in his mother's womb. I think that is in verse 15 of chapter 1. And, and he's going to, that's his whole job. This is, if you want to know about God's election and predestination and sovereignty, if you want to talk about that, right here's a great example. John the Baptist didn't get to vote. 
his mother and his father didn't go to a revival and say, Lord, we're going to have a child and we're going to dedicate him. None of that. God said, here's what's going to happen. This is going to be his name. Here's what he's going to do. Does God have a right to do that? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes it's bad because we don't want to focus on that aspect of who God is, but he certainly has a right to do so. And he's clear in John the Baptist's life. He had one job. It was given to him before he was even formed. And so I want you to keep that in mind. And sometimes we may think, I would love to be a John the Baptist. His whole job was to just shout from the streets. But I want you to see what John the Baptist's life was like. Okay? So for the next couple of hours, I want you to... <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. Um, go to Luke chapter 1, verse 57. Luke 1, 57 and following. And again, this is Christmas story in, in October. That's okay. That's just where we are in our studies. Verse 57 of, of chapter 1 of Luke. Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth. Now remember, Elizabeth is well advanced in years, according to her husband. He didn't call her old. He said she's well advanced in years, well past childbearing, but the Lord gave her um, this, this child, this son. It says, Now the time had come for Elizabeth to give birth, and she brought forth a son, and her neighbors and her relatives heard that the Lord had displayed His great mercy toward her. They were rejoicing with her, and it came about that on the eighth day they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. Now understand this. It was customary in, in this time, biblical times here in the New Testament, that you named your son, your firstborn, after his dad. First of all, in the tribes of Israel, there were 12 tribes, but you kept the name of your ancestors, and it was distinctive to your tribe. So Zacharias and, and his mother Elizabeth, Zachariah and Elizabeth, both were from the tribe of Levi. They were from uh, the, the Aaronic uh, line, which means the priest. Um, Zechariah was a priest, and, and both of them were from the same tribe of Levi. So Zechariah was a name that was specific to that tribe. Other tribes have different names. So it was customary. He's the firstborn. He should be named Zacharias. The eighth day was the day of circumcision. That's when they officially received their name. The neighbors and the community, first of all, this was the talk of the town. This was the hottest ticket on Facebook at that time. This lady, who is old, has now a child. Let's go see. Okay? That's what was going on. They came to circumcise the child. They were going to call him Zacharias after his father. That was customary. Verse 60, and his mother answered and said, no, indeed, he shall be called John. And they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who is called that by name. What in the world? And they made signs to his father as to what he wanted him to be called. In other words, they wouldn't take her, her word for it. Let's ask him. Remember, the Lord had stricken him deaf, mute, because of his unbelief. When the angel said, you're going to have a son, he said, okay, well, let me explain something to you. She's old. She's advanced in years. I'm old. This ain't going to happen. So the angel of the Lord struck him uh, until he was born. So they're saying, let's ask his dad. Verse 63, and he asked for, um, for a tablet and wrote as follows. His name is John. And they were all astonished. And at once his mouth was opened, his tongue loose, and he began to gossip. Is that what he says? He began to complain to God because he couldn't talk for the last nine months. What does it say? He began to speak in praise of God. Honor the Lord. I told you several weeks ago there are three songs Three songs in Luke's uh, writings here of the recording of the gospel. We already went over the first one, the Magnificat, okay? Now we're, we're going to hear about the song of Zechariah. He spoke the praises of God. Verse 65, And fear came on all those living around them, and all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. I told you it was the hottest topic in, of that day. This older lady and couple and now have a child... They're not even going to name him after Zechariah. The whole community is in an uproar. What in the world is going on? They're going to name him John. Which, by the way, um, John um, means God, and grace, uh, God is gracious. That's what the word means. God is gracious. 
So it says, And fear came all, all those, on all those living around them, and all these matters were being talked about in all the hill country of Judea. Verse 66, And all who heard them kept them in mind, saying, What then will this child turn out to be? For the hand of the Lord was certainly on him. And, and that's a, a term that we hear a lot in scriptures, but the hand of the Lord literally means his protection um, or his favor. The favor of God is upon him or the protection of God is on him. So here is Zechariah. Uh, Zechariah's prophecy, you may have a subtitle there in your scripture. By the way, prophecy it has three facets. Prophecy can be foretelling future events, which is what we focus on most of the time. It also can mean celebrating the praises of God, prophesying, celebrating the praises of God. Or third, teach or preach the gospel. And in that vein, we still have prophets, according to spiritual giftedness, who teach or preach the gospel. Um, not so much foretelling the future. We have the Scripture and the Holy Spirit for that. But what Zacharias is doing here mostly is celebrating the praises of God. Watch what he says. And his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying this. And this is Zacharias' song. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited us and accomplished redemption for his people. Redemption for his people. The term here for redemption literally means ransom. It's, it's what the word literally means. He has made a ransom for his people. A ransom was the price paid to deliver a captive taken in war. God's provided a payment to ransom us, to buy us back. That's what it means. Verse 69, And has raised up um, a horn of salvation, or strength of salvation for us in the house of David his servant. As he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from old, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us, to show mercy toward our fathers, to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to Abraham our father, to grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear, and holiness and righteousness before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of God, with which the sunrise from on high shall visit us, to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. And the child continued to grow to become strong in spirit, and he lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel, which, by the way, was probably around 30. Remember, he and Jesus were just a few months apart. And Jesus entered into his ministry around the age of 30, just as John the Baptist. John the Baptist lived in the wilderness his whole life until it was time to do what he had been equipped, called, designed to do. Now, God didn't give John the Baptist a message that was comfortable for people to hear. John the Baptist's message was repent, repent, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repentance means to turn from our sin to anything in particular, to turn to God specifically. What does that require of someone hearing the message? When someone comes to us and says, you need to repent, what must we do? Acknowledge what? Sin. Our sin. John the Baptist's job, his calling, his design, the reason he was created was to tell people, you must repent of your sin and turn to God. The kingdom of God is at hand. He is providing the one to pay the ransom for you. You must turn, repent, acknowledge your sin. That was not the message that a lot of people wanted to hear. Don't you think? Is it hard for us to admit we're wrong? Some of you can't even see. <laughs> I'll back you up a few years. Y'all remember Happy Days? Y'all can sing the song probably. There was, there was this theme, there was this scene in the Happy Days many years ago. The Fonz. Henry Winkler, remember the Fonz? 
Cool this guy on TV. Fonzie went in, went in this conversation with somebody and he was wrong. He was wrong in what he said and he was confronted about that. He was wrong. You need to admit it. Fonzie was the guy that stood in the mirror with the comb, pulled the comb out and looked at himself and said, hey, you know, I'm good just like I am. So they asked him, you, you were wrong in this. So he's practicing, <laughs> repenting, repenting, confessing. He said, I couldn't get it out. Y'all remember that? I was, he just couldn't say a word. I was, and that's us, folks, sometimes. But God, I'm not as bad as them. I haven't done this. I, I haven't said that. I, I'm, I'm in worship twice a week. Once a week. John the Baptist was tasked with the job of going to the people of Israel. We're not talking about the Gentiles right here and now. We're talking about God's chosen people. He's tasked with going to them and saying, you must repent of your sin. For the kingdom of God is at hand. Now would we want to be John the Baptist? I don't think so. He spent his life in the wilderness. He came at the age of 30. And his first sermon and his last sermon. And every sermon in between was the same as far as we know. He proclaimed to everybody that he could find in Israel, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Why is that important? Do you remember when Jesus was tempted in the wilderness when he began his ministry and Satan tempted him and then that was over? Do you remember the first message that Jesus ever preached? Repent, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Same exact message John the Baptist had delivered. Is it important to repent? That was John the Baptist's whole message. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. I want to show you a couple things here briefly about John the Baptist. He had to give up. Um, what about his name? Is your name important to you? Does it, does it rub you the wrong way when people get your name wrong? I've been called Cushion my whole life. See, that's an A. I was called Cushion here recently. Is it Cushion? Us? That's fine. Better than some words I get called. <laughs> A name is important. John was supposed to be Zachariah Jr. That was his name. It, it was about his dad and his heritage. and his, his name was changed because now he's not representing dad or granddad or my ancestors. Now I'm representing God. Our name is changed, folks. We're called Christians, those that follow Christ. And we're known by that above and beyond any correlation to family here on earth. We're supposed to be known by our connection to our Heavenly Father. His name was changed. His life was pre-ordered for him in that he lived in the wilderness. The wilderness is symbolic to our world. We live in a place of death and a place of misery because people are trying to fill that void with everything but Christ. And John the Baptist lived in the midst of all that and had a good feel. He had his, as we would say sometimes, he had his stomach full of the wilderness. So when he comes to preach about life, he knew what he was talking about. You have to turn from the sin that's going to make you stay in this barren place spiritually so that you can experience life, eternal life. You get that? All right. And what John the Baptist was to deliver. He couldn't just say whatever he wanted to say. He gave a message that God had given him that was a hard thing for people to hear. And that was to repent. Now I want you to see verse 80, the last verse that I read. And the child continued to grow, to become strong in spirit. He lived in the deserts until the day of his public appearance to Israel. He continued to grow. Is it in important for you and me to continue to grow in our faith? How do we do that? Yeah. Nourishing in the Word of God. This is our food. This is our man, our daily bread. Without it, we will perish. We must continue to take in God's Holy Word. Can we live a successful Christian life without it? 
No. It's not even a gray area. I'll read something to you from a commentator. A commentator. The song of Zacharias is exceedingly beautiful. It expresses with elegance the great points of the plan of redemption, the mercy of God in providing that plan. That mercy is great. It is worthy of praise of our highest, loftiest songs of thanksgiving, for we were in the shadow of death, sinful, wretched, wandering, and the light arose. The gospel came, and men may rejoice in hope of eternal life. Do we still have the same message to deliver today? Is there still a thing called sin? Is there still one who offers forgiveness of sin? Yes. We're not John the Baptist, but we've been commissioned to spread the gospel, to make disciples. In closing, we found this out even in simple things, just like a giveaway. There are rules, right? There are rules. Driving on the road, are there rules? Don't you get aggravated when people get over in your lane? You get aggravated when the police pull you over and somebody has just passed you going 20 miles an hour faster than you. But on your way home today, I guarantee you, you're going to drive in the right lane and you should stay there until it's time to turn because that's a safe place to be, right? We don't particularly like boundaries when we want to get out of them. But God has given us clear boundaries. And when Jesus came, He said, Listen, you've been living this way. You've got to change. I'm going to do the changing, but you have to change directions. Repent. Go from this way to that way. I was trying to get the children to go out that door. Some of you were trying to get them to go out this door or wherever. They just stayed in the middle because they didn't know which way to go. Jesus has said, I am the way. I am the door. I am the bread of life. We must follow Him, listen to His voice. And we must also tell people, just like John the Baptist, there is a way to tell people sin is still wrong. We must repent of the sin, turn to Him, trust Him, and follow Him. All right? We're going to close with a song. Days of Elijah, we sang it, not, I guess, last week or the week before. Um, the reason we're singing it again today is because it's pertinent to the Scripture. Um, days of Elijah, it means there's still a word to get out to people. There's still wilderness out there, lost people just wandering around looking for life. And they need to hear it from us, folks. Give God permission to change our name so that people call us Christians. We represent Him first. Give God permission to say, Lord, I will go wherever, I will say whatever, I will do whatever, because my life is Yours. I am in Your hands. I am Your servant, Your ambassador. Take me and use me according to Your will and Your way. The altar is always open. As always, you come and pray. You can pray right where you are either way. Would you stand and let's sing together.
Lord, for commissioning us, calling us, equipping us to make disciples. Father, I thank you for what we learned today about John the Baptist and about the one preparing the way. You are coming again a second time. And we have been left with the task of making disciples and preparing the way that those that don't know you can come to know you. Father, we lift you up today in this room, in this place. Prepare us, equip us to live to you 